Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features the Uncanny X-Men annual number 11, cover dated 1987. So this is a giant sized annual that is, it is double sized, 48 pages of story inside. This Alan Davis and Paul Neary cover, featuring Wolverine and Storm front and center. This mysterious figure here in the background, we'll discover who that is on the inside. We've got this antagonist here, we'll discover all about him on the inside of the annual. And we've got an interesting color hold here in the background with uh, various of the X-Men from this particular era. And also Captain Britain and Megan as well. So let's open this one up and take a look at what we have inside. So opening spot, splash page with Wolverine stumbling home um, with some uh, beer cans um, in hand um, after a night on the town and uh, singing uh, this particular uh, show tune here from Brendan Behan's uh, The Hostage play. Uh, so the title of the story is Lost in the Funhouse starring the Uncanny X-Men and Captain Britain, creative team Chris Claremont Ryder, Alan Davis Penciler, Paul Neary Inker, Tom Orzakowski Letters and Glynis Oliver Colors. So one thing to note with uh, this issue is it takes place, the story takes place over the course of one night. And uh, throughout this issue, uh, Davis and Paul Neary, Neary in particular, using a lot of screen tone uh, to indicate the nighttime um, uh, lighting and using the screen tones to great effect, um, I might add. So this is a pretty cool splash page. There's a few lights on in the uh, mansion. Let's see if there's anyone at the door to uh, greet Wolverine. And there is indeed. Dazzler is there in her nightshirt. And um, she hurts Wolverine's eyes with her light show. She lights up the porch. And then everybody arrives out uh, to witness Wolverine uh, drunk on the doorstep. And this is pretty cool. Uh, sequence here where he slices, he used Pops One Claw and uh, slices the top off his uh, Budweiser uh, which he downs, chugs in one go and then belches here on the next page. So everybody's out this particular era, we've got Dazzler, we've got Havoc, we've got Longshot in his uh, tight black underwear. We've got Storm, we know she, she sleeps naked so she's got her dressing gown on. We've got Megan and Brian Braddock, uh, Betsy's twin brother, um, in uh, pajamas and uh, and gown, and Betsy in um, a nightdress um, and gown as well, uh, coming out to meet Wolverine. And we've got Havoc, um, disgusted at Wolverine, charming, a real class act. Mister, you are drunk. And then we got this interesting explanation from Wolverine because, you know, if you know anything about Wolverine, you know that his mutant uh, power is his healing factor. And he explains himself to Havoc here. Booze is a poison and my mutant metabolism neutralizes poisons the moment they're ingested, just like it cures diseases and heals, heals wounds. Even when I want to get blind, stinking, plastered, I can't. And that Havoc is more explanation than I've ever given um, anyone. So that's really interesting. Uh, the implication, of course, is that he has had quite a lot, a hell of a lot uh, to drink in order to be in this state of inebriation. And also that his healing factor may be still after the encounters with um, uh, Lady Deathstrike um, and then um, Nimrod. Um, and the Beyonder have left him um, somewhat still unrecovered uh, from those encounters and his healing factors may be operating at a less than optimum level, which means that he can get drunk. Um, so he makes his way into the mansion, up to his room. Dazzler asks Storm anything we can do for him and Storm says, as Wolverine said, Alison, this is a private matter. Leave him be, my friends. Tomorrow he will be himself again. But what is the matter with Wolverine? Why has he gotten drunk this night? Well, we'll find out in a couple of pages' time. Then, here, we have this uh, sibling moment between Betsy and Brian in the kitchen. Uh, Megan keeps out of it by turning on the TV. And, uh, basically, 
Brian asks his sister, what about your, what about, uh, your own uh, uh, situation? Have you found what you were looking for here at Xavier's school as a member of the X-Men? Um, and she says, I thought I'd be safe, that Xavier's would be a sort of haven where I'd regain my strength and self-reliance so I could get on with the rest of my life, but I was wrong. Nowhere is safe and no one. This is after the Marauders attack on the Morlocks and, and then the X-Men. Will the nightmare ever end, Brian? Are we mutants forever marked by our power human abilities like Cain to always be hunted, sorry, hated and hunted and too often slaughtered? So Brian just won't accept such talk and that he demands, or well, he tells her that she can't let fear destroy her and that he doesn't understand that he's uh, seen her take blows that would smash the strongest spirit and not only survive but triumph. And she says here, I can endure, but as an X-Man, Brian, I have to fight this is a band of warriors and I wonder do I truly belong and if so why and we're going to see this question that she has for herself um, and that started uh, back in um, Uncanny X-Men 213 um, when she was almost killed by Sabretooth this question is going to get addressed in the course of this story she says here um, some seem actually to be born to it, to the warrior life. Wolverine is one, Storm another. I must know, Brian, which am I? And then we switch to Wolverine and he's up in his room. This is interesting. We got a view into his room here. We see the, is it a Shinto shrine? We've got the samurai sword. We've got the wedding uh, photograph of um, Wolverine and Mariko, the wedding that never happened. That was called off by Mariko um, Yashida at the end of Uncanny X-Men 173. And here we have, this is interesting here, we have this little photo of the girl that Wolverine adopted and asked Mariko to adopt, Amiko. So here she is, so he hasn't forgotten her. And he's thinking through um, his situation and um, the pain he feels at being parted from Mariko. And tonight is the night the anniversary of their wedding, the wedding that never was. So it's one year later from that um, story that was covered in um, Uncanny X-Men 172 to 174. Uh, Wolverine thinks to himself here, you called it off, sent me away, told me not to return until you had proved yourself worthy of me as I had of you. I should be samurai, I should be strong, he thinks, but I love you, Miko. How can any warrior survive when he's cut out his heart? So no thoughts of Jean Grey here, notably. And he has scented Jean Grey recently in issues of Uncanny X-Men that has baffled and disturbed him and put her in his mind again. But he's focused all here on Mariko. And he says, um, you know, Wolverine would take what he wanted uh, regardless of rules, morality or honor, but he's Logan. And like it or not, Logan's a man. Sometimes though, it hurts so bad missing you. The warrior's way seems so hard. So he asks her forgiveness. I feel as though I give my soul for things to be different. So that's going to be tested later on in the annual. And then we move um, focus and scene up to Storm's Attic Loft. And I like this um, top down vision or view rather of uh, the X-Mansion. So we see the, the, the different wings here, and this is Storm wing, wing here, and we see the, um, the skylights to her attic loft, which we can see from the inside there. And we see the swimming pool and diving boards out back too. Uh, so nicely done. And Davis had drawn her bedroom um, in uh, Uncanny X-Men 213 when um, Psylocke uh, fled um, Sabretooth up there and was using um, um, uh, one of these, um, implements on the wall to uh, fight Sabretooth before Wolverine arrived through the skylight uh, to help her out. So here she grabs this um, uh, this uh, implement because she becomes aware of an intruder behind her. And we see here with the uh, screen tone, the silhouette of a hand reaching out to grab her and she is uh, knocked out from behind. Instantly, Betsy downstairs realizes that there's an attack on Storm, and so um, she alerts uh, the X-Men telepathically, and here comes Rogue uh, coming full tilt from the mansion's um, hangar complex, 
and dressed in work overalls. So she's obviously been tinkering away with the Blackbird. And then um, Brian and uh, Megan fly along with um, Rogue through the skylight window to find some creep uh, with Storm here in silhouette. So who is he? Uh, then elsewhere in the mansion, we have Wolverine emerging from his bedroom, knocking into Dazzler, and then he's grabbed um, and thrown at Havoc and Dazzler. Longshot emerges, but he's grabbed through a wall uh, from behind and presumably uh, knocked out. And then there's only Psylocke left. And this silhouetted figure says, your friends are beaten, surrender or they die. So she thinks that's no choice at all. She could escape, but to what purpose? If that means the X-Men's death, so she, she yields and the stranger wins. And this is the stranger. He introduces himself here as Horde. Kind of like his uh, character design, design with the horns makes him look devilish, demonic, of course. And he is a kind of demon here. And with a wave of his hand, he teleports the uh, unconscious um, X-Men to another dimension. Um, and they uh he he basically explains to to them that he knows all about them that he's studied them and he's taken a fancy to storm and tells her that um if uh, they prove themselves worthy he'll he'll reward um them and her by making her his consort so he uh kisses her there and then flings her to the ground this guy um high on confidence and arrogance and he goes through each of the X-Men members, uh, grabbing them uh, by, the, by the hair or a head or a chin here, and basically explaining to them that none of them are going to be able to use their powers against him. They have no chance against him, but Dazzler nonetheless lashes out with her um, light powers, unleashing a laser blast of unimaginable intensity. And so this is pretty nicely rendered here. Uh, with the, um, the the spotting of blacks um, indicating that he's getting a full overload of this uh, laser blast. And then all the X-Men uh, basically attack um, Horde in unison. We see it here um, in these panels, but Storm demurs and stands back, um, thinking that this is too pat, too easy. There has to be a catch. And indeed there is because Horde emerges from the combined attack uh, without a scratch. And so he explains what he wants them for. He wants them to break into the Citadel of Light and Shadow. Here it is conveniently um, on, the opposite, on the next page, so we can see it here. And he explains that he wants them to steal for him its legendary treasure, the Crystal of Ultimate Vision, okay? So um, Storm asks him, why us? And he explains, because as thieves, you're just about the best. You have the poor power, rather, she insists. Why not do the job yourself? And he basically um, says, you know, why, why sully his own nails when he can have menials do it for him? And why should we, asks Storm? Because if you refuse, I'll destroy your world. So Storm basically concludes, we have no choice. Where is the Citadel? Here it is here. And note, if you kind of pay attention to these uh, silhouetted figures uh, with screen tone here, we've got um, a scroll, we've got Kree, and we've got members of other var various alien races standing in statue sentinel to the entranceway to uh, the Citadel. So... The X-Men take it all in and they make their way towards the Citadel and Storm explaining, look, um, he sends us as he has others before us to claim his prize, which suggests that somewhere within is something that terrifies him that can perhaps even destroy him. All we need to do is find it and learn to use it. So um, she's thinking, she's team leader, she's got a plan and... Um, then she says to Logan as they're about to crash or cross the threshold, she says, how fortunate then we have a long shot with us to help play it. How has, his power is his fantastic look, 
let us hope it serves as well and if not logan then as the saying goes this is a good as good a day as any to die and the best of friends to do so with and she kisses him on the lips this is interesting and this has prompted some commentators to wonder about the nature of the relationship between storm and wolverine at this juncture in the team's history that they may be having something of a um, shall we say sexual relationship not a romantic one because it's very clear here that wolverine's heart is um given to mariko so this is something else um purely sexual perhaps between wolverine and storm given that this is approved by the commerce code authority it's all subtextual yes all between the lines but we see hint more hints of it later on in the outback era um so they enter they cross the threshold horde remaining outside but longshot is reluctant to enter he says his legs don't want to walk my hearts don't want to make them he's got multiple hearts longshot remember and given that he's an alien there we see his three fingers as well so we have to be reminded of that fact and ali wants him to come with her we're x-men she says to him we need we're a team we need you and then she thinks privately i need you so he comes in and the door of course slams shut behind them um captain britain tries to make his way uh, uh, uh or um, shoulder his way through the door but no possibility there havoc tries to plasma blast through the door no luck and um interesting little movie reference here he says like krell metal in the movie forbidden planet uh the doorway is not even warm after his uh, plasma blasting so where do we go from here asks rogue so uh wolverine uh goes um on point um and scouts ahead and psylocke keeps in telepathic contact with him and rogue as wolverine um, stalks away asks storm you sure he's the right one to act as scout flawed or not rogue we have none to depend on but ourselves we must make the best of that storm responds and she and rogue says wish i had your fate faith what the heck and now we see how the citadel operates so rogue is attracted to this uh screen of glass and through it she sees herself as uh, a plantation princess um belle of the ball as she thinks with the handsomest um, of gentry her bows laughing loving happy in a way that she's never been i could never be and um she um is um absorbed in through uh the crystal wall and she becomes uh the belle in her vision and that becomes her reality and um she uh turns into or, or this statue of her frozen statue turns to dust um as she has uh accepted her heart's desire to become this figure so now we're beginning to get some information and ideas about how the citadel operates and have a gas storm will that happen to to all of us and storm concludes a brilliant defense to offer no more than what a person wants who can resist some such temptation small wonder horde sends others in his place because horde's ambition is to become master of the universe of course um so he couldn't go in there uh because that's what the citadel would offer him and he'd succumb to the temptation but what about the x-men will they last and then we get this very interesting bit here with longshot who is pure of heart of course and um as the x-men go ahead to explore the labyrinth um longshot sees his hand turning invisible and he thinks is this my desire to fade away no no that's wrong he thinks all i want is to help my friends if only i knew how and so interesting this because we see longshot's um identity crisis play out ultimately in the outback era and come to a climax in uncanny x-men 248 where he does fade away uh from the team um but back with this annual it's havoc's turn to uh be offered his heart's desire and he explains here 
None of the X-Men know what it's like for him to have to stay absolutely completely in control of his power every stinking second of every stinking day. All this power bottled up inside with me terrified I'll let it out. I take raw random cosmic energy and cohere it into a focused plasma state. I'm a living solar reactor cast in human form. I do inside my body just what the sun does. And if I ever cut loose the way I've always been terrified I could, the way I always wanted to, a star is what I'll become. And I like the way that Davis has interpreted this uh, with these horizontal panels and the imagery reflecting what he's talking about, the sun, the star, and uh, maybe Havoc's ultimate destiny if he gives in to um, his fondest desire to let go. And he does here within the Citadel, and so he's knocked out. Um, Psylocke concludes he found his destiny. He is at peace. Storm is pragmatic. There are far worse fates. Or sorry, rather, um, Psylocke is pragmatic. She says there are far worse fates. And Storm asks her, um, any sign of Wolverine? So she's still in contact with him. He's far ahead, traversing a fantastic maze, thus far without incident. But then we switch focus to uh, a Dazzler who sees Longshot disappear and nobody's able to help him. He flies away. He says here, the Citadel calling me, pulling myself out of me, doesn't want me to be apart from it like you all, like you all are. Wants me to be a part of it. And then he's gone, despite Dazzler's attempt to help him. And um, Psylocke explains, I sense his presence all around us. He's become one with the Citadel. But why, asks Megan? Because his innocence, Megan, his innate purity. We have hearts, desires, choices to make about our lives and destinies. Perhaps the Citadel couldn't stand Longshot having none. No way to exploit him, so absorbed him into the Citadel. Um... Dazzler is distraught here. She thinks it's uh, her fault uh, for um, encouraging him to enter into the Citadel when he didn't want to uh, enter. And so she runs off and we're going to see how she's tempted by the Citadel. As she runs away, she stumbles and falls. Um, Psylocke makes contact with her, but then her light goes out. And here's the temptation for her. She sees herself as um, a high-flying um, um, lawyer um, um, who is prosecuting the kingpin and gets him convicted with a life sentence and then sees the course of that career uh, landing her as first uh, female chief justice of the United States and she thinks that could have been my life my future if I'd done as dad wanted followed in his footsteps gone to law, law school he loved the law, I think, more sometimes than me. Why couldn't I? And that is um, part of Claremont's um, analysis of the character that she does have, you know, so to speak, this uh, defining father complex, her father's wishes, and very much feature in um, her characterization. And then she thinks about the choice she made um, in, um, in conflict with her father's wishes, where she became... Um, a pop star um, and yet she could, couldn't hack um, a career as that. What happened? Why aren't I the best pop star? Something stopped me. Something always stops me. Uh, maybe that's how I'll go through life, just missing the brass ring, a woman of unrealized potential, unfulfilled dreams, splendid promise that never comes to fruition, a loser, um, a homeless uh, woman on the streets. And we're going to see this again. The Siege Perilous will show her these possibilities and others in Uncanny X-Men 246. So again, we're seeing the way that Claremont is thinking about um, Alison Blair's characterization as he is adding her properly to the X-Men team for the first time in this era. So here she's faced with these three choices. And this is very interesting, the way she says, if I never take a risk, I'll never have to worry about making a mistake, failing, being hurt. There's safety in defeat, luxury in self-pity. Is that what I really want? But it seems that that's what she chooses, to be um, a homeless bag lady, um, not taking any risks, and basically opting out of life. And so Psylocke twigs that they've lost her. Um, and now we get Psylocke's secret desire, she uh, knocks in frustration. This column 
of the Citadel and it smashes into crystal shards and one of them breaks her skin and underneath she sees that she's solid metal. So what's going on there? Um, Captain Britain, meanwhile, is thinking that the tide's turning. Uh, you look after Storm and Betsy Megan, I'll lead the way as he uh, blasts his way through various levels of the Citadel, finding uh, the core and the crystal. And um, Psylocke confirms that the crystal is inside. She says, it resonates in my head like a living mind, a consciousness unlike any I've ever encountered. I can perceive only a fraction of it. Oh my friends, the majesty, the wonder, it's so beautiful. So, Storm gets ready to enter and um, Captain Britain is distracted. Uh, something within the mound of crystal rubble, he has to know what. And in it, he sees a vision of a domestic, a vision of domestic bliss uh, for himself and Megan with a son and another baby on the way. Megan hopes that, that um, it can be um, a girl and she's delighted and even he's delighted. And um, Betsy's there too as part of uh, the domestic um, scene. And um, he invites Betsy uh, to uh, come with him and um, enjoy uh, laying down responsibilities. That's always what drives Brian Braddock, his sense of responsibility. But she says here, you have your dream, Brian, I have mine. And then she tears the skin off to reveal this metallic warrior self beneath. And this again is very interesting characterization of Psylocke and we'll see it play out in the Outback era where she becomes tougher, where she actually gets a metallic armored um, uniform. And ultimately, of course, after she goes through the uh, Siege Perilous, emerging as a ninja warrior. So Brian and Megan disappear into the fantasy held out for them by the crystal, but Psylocke remains on guard outside as Storm enters uh, the, uh, the edifice. And now we pick up with Wolverine, who has been out um, in, um, in advance of the rest for the whole time. And here the Citadel is tempting him with, of course, Mariko. And he thinks, you're every, or he says to her, you're everything I'm not, soft where I'm hard, gentle where I'm rough, a woman of breeding and culture. I'm a backwoods brawler. What the blazes do you see in me? And then they kiss and she transforms. This is great work here on this page by Alan Davis. Um, the evocation of Japan, the cherry blossom, the Buddha. Um, um, Wolverine's wedding robes, Mariko's. And then I love this magenta background here with the uh, cherry blossom uh, flying in the breeze as he kisses her, but then she transforms into um, a, um, a kind of like a, a version of himself in a way. Um, he asks her, what the devil's happening? Only what you'd expect, sweets, on our wedding night. Um, she says, I belong with you, Logan, a wild woman for my wild man. And so this is his temptation. As he says here, I want you so much it hurts, but he smashes out at the illusion and smashes through, conveniently enough, uh, the ceiling overhanging just where the crystal is. And so he sees Psylocke battling Horde, wishes he could help, but um, smashes through the ceiling of the edifice um, around the crystal. And right in the center, we've got Storm about to arrive, but she's yanked from behind into the uh, crystal wall. And where does she find herself? Except back in the world of Uncanny X, Japan, Tokyo, Uncanny X-Men circa 172 to 73, and a wild night out with um, Yukio. And her costume has changed too. And she thinks to herself, is this what she wants to be a thief again, to dance always on the edge of oblivion with none to care for, but ourselves living from moment to moment, enjoying each to the fullest. I never knew truly how to laugh before I met Yukio. In many ways, I've never been as happy since. I want to join her, but this is wrong, she thinks. But this is the wrong place, the wrong time, the wrong way. She leads the X-Men that responsibility she cannot abandon, 
but some of the desire still hangs on with her because the clothes remain on her and then Wolverine smashes through the roof there he is and Psylocke has been defeated by Horde and Wolverine pushes Storm into the crystal wall um, and she protests for a split second she tries to resist I like the way that this uh, storytelling is done here we see her looking back but then uh, seeing Yukio again um, I should note also the color hold here uh, for um, nighttime neon lit uh, Tokyo uh, nice effect as well and the tug on her heartstrings is too strong this dream too welcome so that's that's it for storm and that leaves Wolverine only who goes for the crystal um, to is it destroy it and he thinks to himself of all the team my adamantium bones and healing factor give me the best chance to beat Horde to the prize but Horde um, uh, hits him in the back with this javelin and then this gruesome scene here Claremont notice pulling back on the narrative captions uh, Horde's nails or talons emerge from his fingers and he rips out Wolverine's throat or not throat rather but heart and as he does so but as Horde tears free his grisly prize this um, this um, uh, drop of blood hits the crystal and something happens Horde is distraught he knows he's about to fail and this is extraordinary what happens is he's killed Wolverine but before his eyes between one blink and the next he beholds the miracle of life begun anew he hates it so Wolverine is regenerated from a single drop of blood and just look at the illustration here of um, Davis um, with the DNA uh, turning into nerves the brain the eyes the organs then the skeleton the muscle um, even a little bit of hair up here as Wolverine is reconstructed and he asks how this is impossible you were dead I killed you that's what I thought Wolverine says but my healing factors in every cell of my body so I guess it so I guess is my will to live given sufficient power my entire body could be regenerated from the genetic data encoded in a single cell or a drop of blood so it's the power of the crystal the unlimited power of the crystal uh, that restores his body and uh, mind both and it would appear also uh, the adamantium laced in his skeleton because uh, that comes back too and then Wolverine knows and takes the crystal um, from um, from uh, Horde's brow and that's the secret to defeating him and we're told in the narrative captions here Horde's lived a long time an eternity's worth of rapacious cruelty and self-indulgence without the crystal shard to sustain him however all his vices all his crimes catch up with him Wolverine doesn't notice Horde's final moments as he turns to dust by the way just a point here on this regeneration of Wolverine it does remind me of Dave Gibbons's um, illustration of the regeneration of John Osterman in Watchmen and I'm pretty sure that um, Davis must have had that in front of him as he was uh, drawing these panels here it's quite reminiscent of it um, and here we've got Wolverine um, and this is reminiscent of uh, Rachel Phoenix in issue 203 of Uncanny X-Men when she becomes cosmically one with the universe also a bit of like Jim Starlin um, uh, uh, Warlock lying behind uh, this um, these few panels here um, so Wolverine um, asks was this how Jean Grey felt when she became Phoenix I can sense everything every particle of matter every burst of energy every living thing in all creation so the universe is his to do with as he wishes so what does he wish well you know he wants to be with Mariko but he thinks here I can touch every soul with an awareness of honor decency courage I can transform shape create heal destroy stop before I start I'm talking like God he realizes only I ain't God that was Horde's trip and so he concludes here thing I always hated most was a body mucking with my mind and soul 
if I can't abide that being done to me, I got no right doing it to others, no matter how fine my rationalizations. But I can't just walk away. So he decides to destroy the crystal, even if it means the death of the X-Men in the Citadel, uh, for the sake of um, the universe, uh, before he would be tempted to tinker with things as God. And so it looks like that's it for the X-Men, but of course not. So we pick up in the X-Mansion, and it seems to the X-Men, who turn up in costume though, um, in their bedrooms in the mansion, uh, that it was a dream maybe, but how could it be a dream when they're waking up in their costumes? And so they compare notes, and we get some thoughts from them here, where Dazzler has learned, you know, is she, is she so totally chicken? Do I really believe myself to be such a loser that you would choose the life of a homeless bag lady over taking any risks? And Storm wondering Yukio, I almost wish this was the fantasy and that Tokyo my reality. She's conflicted. Um, Scarlet O Rogue, she loved it. She loved being Bella the Bull. Havoc here thinking, typically enough, he can't ever lose control, a bit like his older brother. He wouldn't like that comparison. And then Psylocke here, she realizes what she wants to be. The question she had in the kitchen earlier that night has been resolved. She knows now where she belongs and more importantly, why. She does want to be that warrior woman. And uh, Brian also uh, hopes that one day Megan and he will be as fortunate. And Megan's fairly confident about that. Um, and then where's Wolverine? So long shot. Um, looks out or, or enters Wolverine's bedroom, they enter gingerly, and there he is um, as a samurai, uh, standing guard watching over our bodies, as, did, as he did our spirits, Storm thinks, as much as worthy the X-Men's champion, and she thinks and perhaps creations as well, as he is his lady Mariko's. So a poignant ending for Wolverine, but now we get the full story on what was going on with the Citadel. Storm looks off into space. Um, soon she senses the adventure will be forgotten like any, any dream. And so she'll probably never know the price of the victory, save that it was as terrible in its own way as the cost of defeat. And that too, she thinks, is for the best. Across the infinite, statues stand tall and silent before their shattered citadel. Only these aren't statues. Okay, so here comes the explanation. Each came in turn seeking the crystal, unaware it was in reality a test, as old and enduring as time, to attain this ultimate prize, yet denied the temptation of its power, is the mark of a truly mature species. The quester is returned home, his race allowed to evolve to its full potential. But those who try to use the crystal find themselves transformed into these eternal guardians, Worse, their races are genetically frozen in place, never to evolve another step, forever left behind while the rest of creation passes them by. Humanity will never know the debt it owes to Wolverine and the X-Men, for tonight the race faced its ultimate test, and thanks to its wayward, outcast children, the X-Men passed the end. So there you go. Um, I do hope that you enjoyed this review and commentary on uh, Uncanny X-Men Annual 10. If you did, please like the video on YouTube. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this.